how does that really work like uh, can if you can share a few examples in terms of how does um, uh, using a core biomarker in 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 the world of uh, executive performance executive coaching actually uh, make a difference okay so yeah i'll give you two good examples um one uh whether you want to call us biohacking biomarker um one example is this because I'm still a licensed clinical and neuropsychologist I work with a lot of a lot of people high performers come to me now especially since the pandemic and and they want to know whether they have ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder um and the traditional way to diagnose this is you look at uh questionnaire data you look at their you ask them a number of questions do they meet criteria for the symptoms but there are biomarkers that that are not 100% accurate but that are highly predictive for example we do something i do is quantitative eeg which is an eeg like you'd get at a neurologist's office or a sleep study except we compare it to a large sample of normals and we look at basically if there's deviations um in terms of let's say fast beta waves or slow theta waves uh, or delta waves relative to healthy individuals of the same age and that is uh that's something i do with most of my clients so for example they want to know if they have adhd and what i'll do is one of the things of one piece of information is this quantitative eeg and interestingly what we find is what we know from the literature is about 85% of people with adhd have excessive slow waves uh, or underactivity or under arousal in the brain particularly the frontal lobe and the central uh, top layer of the brain the, the central and frontal parts um of the brain have excessive slow waves and eegs are actually quite stable unless you're just pounded down three cups of coffee or you didn't sleep at all last night or you smoked marijuana uh other than that if you're a little bit stressed uh, or a little bit tired it doesn't have a big effect on the on the quantitative eeg uh, when we compare it to national norms and what we see is like i said 85% of individuals with adhd have excessive slow wave activity again under arousal under activation this is why the treatment of choice by physicians is a prescription of stimulant medication which to a lot of people seems confusing especially when you think of adhd children or adults who tend to be hyper talking fast uh can't sit still um why would you give them a stimulant you want to slow them down not speed them up but it's because their brains are under aroused and they need to constantly move and do things and change subjects to stay at a normal level of arousal in their brain and so this is why prescription uh, stimulant medications are prescribed so one of the things we look at is do they have this biomarker uh it used to be called in the literature called the theta beta ratio so theta is slow wave activity beta is faster wave activity and when they have depends on the age category uh, adults is about 2 point something a ratio of uh, everyone has more theta than beta uh, but you don't want it much higher than that and if you do that's highly consistent with individuals with ADHD but it's not just with ADHD it helps me understand a person who comes in so someone who's got troubles with motivation uh um, troubles with uh uh you know being as good as they want to be in their sport or in in their life um if they have a brain map that suggests this you know th- this this can determine what in a way i quote unquote prescribe uh for them in the sense of what kind of maybe i don't sell supplements but like what supplements they want me want to look into and always talk to their doctor um what kind of brain training or neurofeedback would be helpful um what, what whether they should be using caffeine and how much they should be using um whether they should try to meditate so all these things play a role that's one example is the theta beta uh, ratio is a biomarker that we use to help uh, with identification of ADHD um The other biomarkers we use another main one is is basically heart rate variability or HRV like we we're saying <clears throat> HRV is uh as you know cardiologists discovered this uh, years ago that it helps predict heart attack risk with individuals with heart disease but these are wearing 24 halter monitors um then we know uh, you know uh, pedi- uh, obstetricians use it to measure the state of the health of the baby in in the womb um and uh exercise physiologists know that HRV or heart rate variability goes down when we uh, are overtrained and it's uh, any high level athlete should be measuring their HRV uh preferably in my opinion with something like an aura ring uh, i'm sure you're quite familiar with these um you you want an overnight measure in my opinion as opposed to measuring it you know every day at uh, 9 o'clock because there's so many factors that can affect that whether you've gone to the bathroom how hungry you are you know, how well you slept just before you woke up um whether you've eaten any food 
all of these can, whether you've checked a, a stressful email can artificially uh, affect your HRV. And so a longer overnight average is better. And of course, now we know, we've known this for a long time, psychophysiology, or basically the profession that I'm involved in as well, uh, we know that HRV goes down when we are psychologically stressed. Or of course, we know if we're sick. So anything's wrong with our nervous system or HRV drops. So having uh, knowing someone's HRV baseline, and again, you want to know this over a longer period of time. So ideally, uh, the higher level clients so that sometimes I work with will have an aura ring uh, and uh, or uh, some sort of whoop strap or something they use that measures overnight HRV and we look for deviations in that to help determine because you know some people uh, everyone's got a different baseline like the RMSSD which is the main HRV me metric that for example aura ring uses um, uh, this uh, some people like mine is on average 80 uh, 80 milliseconds, whereas some people it's 15 and they get really upset and think there's something wrong with them. But this is, it's better to look at your relative change. So these are ways that we do use uh, biomarkers in a way to, to help uh, with performance. Um, there's some other things I do. Um, for example, I do something called psychophysiological, psychophysiological stress testing. And what that means is it's a standardized uh, set of uh, stimuli that's often used in research, but we use this with athletes and we use this uh, to measure stress levels. So essentially we have someone come to the office, we sit them down, we use quite fancy equipment and we measure uh, uh, everything from heart rate, sweat response, uh, temperature, um, muscle tension, heart rate variability, and we do an EEG at the same time. And what we do is we have them sit down for about two minutes with eyes open and eyes closed, doing nothing to get a baseline. And then we have these standardized stressors. I won't say exactly what they are. They're not traumatic in any way, but they're stressful things they need to do in front of a computer or with my assistant. And we measure what does our physiology do during the stressor and what happens after each stressor, they have about a 70 second rest period. What happens after that? And so we wanna know how they're doing. I'll give you an example. Uh, I did a lot of work with one of the local police services. I still work with a different police service right now. And we were following the high uh, risk officers. So these are the specialty groups like the homicide units, uh, the tactical, which is the SWAT team, uh, accident reconstruction unit. These are people you know, deal with people who get badly injured in car accidents uh, and pick up bodies, things like this. And we, they wanted me to check in on them every year. Traditionally, this is called safeguarding. Traditionally, this involves simply seeing a psychologist once a year and the psychologist asks, how are you? And they, I, I, most of them, I know policing, most of them are gonna say, I am perfectly fine. And now what we did, we did this for about three years. We stopped during COVID, but uh, the, what we found was a lot of these officers would say they're fine. We do a psychophysiological stress profile. We'll see they're not as fine as they perceive themselves to be and we give them feedback. We show them the graphs and we say, look, this is what we'd like your sweat response after this, during the stressor, we expect it to go up. When you're resting, we expect it to come down. This, the sweat response is a pure measure of sympathetic arousal or stress. And, um, and you'll see like a lot of these, it keeps going up like a staircase over the test. And I say like, this is interesting. So if this is a 20 minute test. Imagine you're facing much more severe stressors throughout the day. You may not be noticing or be aware that you're having stress, but your body is having a hard time regulating the stress. So this was a real, like the, the officers love this because it was objective data that could help them uh, see what they couldn't see. So these are just three examples of how I use basically physiological or neurological uh, metrics to help uh, people understand themselves. What's really fascinating is the fact that um, the, the biomarkers or the methods that you mentioned, uh, the theta, mm -hmm. beta ratio, uh, HRV, uh, especially these are both on the spectrum of performance. Of course, athletes do use it. Um, and in some cases, you use the first one, the theta beta ratio to detect uh, brain activity, ADHD. Um, at the same time, mm -hmm. uh, these are quite applicable for, for apart from performance, your, uh, uh, your clinical uh, diagnostics as well, uh, which, is, which basically mm -hmm. talks about the spectrum of these interventions that uh, it's the same human brain, it's the same uh, nervous system, uh, 